All right, so I want to make sure we give the maximum amount of time available to Dr. Hahn and for everybody to ask questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started, and I would like to formally welcome all of you to this teach-in series, the College of Arts and Sciences and Women and Gender Studies teach-in series lecture given by uh, Dr. Hahn. And we are very grateful that you are all joining us this lovely afternoon. And this is the last of the so far scheduled teach-in events. We will let you know if any more join the books. We would love to continue to have these events. So uh, without further ado, I will go ahead and pass the mic on over to Dr. Hahn. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Barbara, for these uh, uh, for the opportunity and for your nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate, and I think um, I hope, as my background and my history, I can contribute. And uh, I'm very curious about your questions afterwards. I hope it's not so awkward. Oh, by the way, can you all hear me? I'm, I'm not sure with my connection. Okay, hopefully nothing is breaking down. <laughs> so yes, uh, so I put it pretty quick together. It was a recycled talk for uh, at GBB for sixth graders, uh, but I'm trying to um, give you a little bit of background, uh, how I came over here to United States coming um, from East Germany, the, uh, for more communist country. So I'm going to share with you uh, some slides and I hope everything works technically out. Um, okay. So, so this year we had the 30th anniversary of the German unification and that's why also I was very motivated uh, just to go over my past a little bit at that point, uh, not to be too stuck with current events, just go look back once in a while where I, I'm coming from, my roots, and that, that's actually want to share with you some specifics. It's not comprehensive, it's not, uh, it's, I'm not a prototype of uh, an East German citizen, uh, every life they has was unique and yes we share some common things but everybody from East Germany has perceived the reality or the history a little bit different and had different experience so I just give you my perspective um, something from my perspective and the way I grew up and uh, the way I came over here and the subtitle is uh, what I plan to become and that's what I am right now, um, associate professor in chemistry and the chair of the chemistry department. And that that I really haven't planned at all. So um, these pictures here on the title page showed uh, the uh, upper one here, um, the the guy the uh, soldiers in front of the Brandenburg Gate on the top left side. That was also picture now. His textbooks are very familiar with that picture. So we all kids had that. Um, they uh, was interpreted. They protect us against the aggressors from West uh, West Germany, in particular the aggressors from the United States. So so now I'm actually here, and it's kind of really uh, interesting to me how. Uh, ideology was said to me as a child and now I'm actually here uh, on the other side what was uh, where used to be our enemies called our enemies so you're on the bottom right there also another picture of what we are very familiar with when we grew up that was a common scene in in our uh, news and um, newspapers and uh, media and okay I want to move on so I grew up okay you just a map just for everyone who's not familiar with Europe so Germany is located right in the center of Europe pretty much and interesting is 
So Germany um, had the split of the East East Europe and West U Europe politically. Uh, the um, after the Second World War, um, we had East Germany as a Russian sector, and Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and uh, Bulgaria, Romania, all these countries in the set of called the Soviet Union, uh, this belong all to the, the socialist uh, block, uh, block of trees, while West Germany and uh, Italy and all the, the rest part of Europe uh, was uh, the free was free marketing and had a very different history after the Second World War. So, and more zoomed in. So, I was born uh, and grew up there in a middle in middle Germany where the flag is there, uh, relatively close to the border, but that close. So we. We are not that strictly observed, but um, was quite a bit uh, close. And um, so, the what the, uh, to, for clarification, often people get this a little bit wrong. The the wall was uh, around West Berlin. So West uh, this Berlin was also split in one third the Russian sector and two third the allies, so the British, French and American sector. Um, that kind of correspond to the ratio of how they split Germany in total and one third and two thirds. And so the wall specific, specifically was built around West Berlin and West Berlin was kind of an island within East Germany. So um, so, but the border, we had an addition, of course, all the, the border, which was about, um, what in miles, maybe 300 miles or so long from north to the, uh, from north to the south. And that was, it was not a concrete wall. That was just a, um, a half mile or so, um, stripe. Uh, no man's land were mined and with with towers and uh, very closely uh, watched and so and then we had the border to Czechoslovakia and Poland which was not that tightly closed but also we had the border controls but the border to West Germany was there was no way to go some some people a couple of hundred people tried to do that more or less successful, very inventive with balloons or with River Elbe, which merged right here at the top of the flag uh, to the border and um, it's like Rio Grande or something. Um, people tried there with subways or other vehicles. Well, people were very inventive to escape uh, East Germany because of issues with uh, the country. My family uh, has never intended to go, and I did. We didn't see the reason. Yes, we, there were things annoying, uh, but it was not that annoying. If you live, if you uh, love your home and your the way where you live, and you have friends and and family over there, uh, we we kind of cope with the situation. It wasn't a reason to leave our country. So we never had ever the thought. Um, so I grew up on a countryside in a little village, and this was my the home, the house I grew up in. The, the village was the name Gusefeld, but don't remember that name. It's it's only 200, 200, 300 people live there. It was a really it it still is a really nice village, and this is kind of a house there um, and so my father worked in the church and my, my both my parents worked in the church uh, as my father was a pastor and my, my mother also did uh, the teaching so yes we had church church was tolerated uh, by the government but not really supported and 
not not extremely suppressed suppressed but it was tolerated um other countries had more trouble and but in east germany there was kind of an a tolerance uh, but of course everybody who was went to church and was involved with church activities were closely uh, spied and uh, watched and any activity what the church is doing has been watched by the security service so this house uh, was uh, I, I grew up at in the in the back you see all these trees we had a kind of a park that was so called the pastor park so there was people used to walk there before church they are in the park but actually that park was more pretty wild and we had a lot of we had a great time playing there in the back and we had a big garden and so on the side on one side of the, the house we had a room also for church gathering and i come in a minute to that function because that w was then our main church uh, room where my father used to preach there so we have didn't have it for so we had here all, all the living room and my father's office room and my brother's room on the top and we had a lot of chambers so there was a it was a really great time living there on the village and uh, we we had a lot of we had a really great time in family gatherings in the summer and uh, so that was my first experience in my life growing there up I want to show a little bit more other perspective. So that was the same house. Um, the photo, I, the previous slide, the photo was uh, done later when I re already left. Uh, that's this black and white picture somewhere in the winter in the late 60s, I would say. And I came to the world in 1970. And the, this picture has been done around 72 and capture while kind of getting into technical stuff maybe that was my bias so my older brother he always showed me a lot of stuff and explained me things and uh, and my father he actually was pretty into uh, much into photography and developing photos and uh, he had a little photo laboratory and that's all kind of the roots the the bias to chemistry so that was pretty much influenced by my my brother and my my father. So the village had a little church there. So typically, all the little villages in uh, that area in in, in Germany, um, they have these little churches for maybe 50 people or something, 600 people to go, because that's about what every village has. Uh, so these are built from uh, big rocks from from the field. There are a lot of in that area. We have a lot of big rocks there, um, everywhere around in a landscape, and they have been collected and built these churches. And but it was the same year. Probably the picture uh, for me was done in '72. In the fall of 72, we experienced a very huge storm or kind of a tornado. It was really, uh, that was my actually my first really experience. I watched from the living or living room and I saw that tower here on the top, uh, this bell tower, I saw um, moving. That was my first experience. So that was a terrible one. And I saw with my older sister how this is kind of start swinging around. And what happened, that whole thing fell in the roof of the church and destroyed the church. I have never remember having been in that church because I was uh, too little to remember. But all I remember is a broken church in our village. So my father often went then to try to clean up stuff. Often he did by himself and he went, uh, he had sometimes some other uh, young people from, young men from the um, church community or from the 
from our village helping there a little bit but there was no of course the state so there was no support no money and uh, all the time we lived there we there was nothing it was just like that so but my father always went there to kind of save some uh, precious things there and to get some uh, things up and uh, kind of probably that's the why I'm kind of uh, remembers me now with uh, that that extent but I'm kind of try to clean up all uh, to kind of make that work and I remember my father a lot when he went there and worked by himself and not too much support but um, Okay, that's another topic. But anyways, the, uh, that was the, some picture from the storm. And so there were my, kind of my first experience that our, our house got, the, the roof got damaged and all, I saw the trees coming down. And so, but anyways, nature, uh, we, we cut all the trees down and make it make up and things became uh, repaired. So anyways, I went in a, in a village, I went to kindergarten and this is a picture when uh, uh, at the last day before uh, being released, graduate from kindergarten to go to a school, um, to first grade. So we have in Germany tradition, these, uh, you, you see all the cones here, uh, the, these are the sugar cones and we got one from a kindergarten actually the parents made it and they uh, gave it us for kind of kindergarten graduation so there's just filled with candy and goodies and stuff so that is kind of a tradition it has nothing to do with any political Id or ideology or something um, it was, it's just our German tradition but I remember um, I don't, ha I don't have the time to pull out all the picture, but I know I have picture and I remember we had inside in the, in the kindergarten, we had a picture of our country leader, the communist party leader. So in every classroom, even in the kindergarten, we had pictures from our communistic party leader. Uh, so that was kind of classical. So um, then this is the picture from first, uh, day in school with our at uh, our district we had to go by school bus there and here's the actual the, the real sugar cone that from the kindergarten it was just a preliminary uh, for the kindergarten graduation but this is the actual sugar cone and it's really big uh, and so this is a traditional picture for uh, coming to school and uh, the tradition is still going on. I think they do still do the sugar cone at the first day of class is the, our tradition. So uh, we have uh, my, this one, my, my teacher, but she, I thought she passed away. She had the surgery for about uh, five, eight years ago or so. She's about the age of my parents. Um, and then we had another lady, she took she was a kind of educator. She uh, took care of um, everybody in class to get along with the homeworks for kind of tutoring and just supporting the, the teacher. So to keep everybody straight. So of course we had a, uh, the so-called pioneer organization. Um, my parents did not, not want to have me in that organization. And there was a lot of and forth between my parents and the teachers uh, about certain compliant things because sometimes I didn't attend certain things, political events, and I should. And so I was a little bit in between the fronts, uh, but okay, I got along with that. It was sometimes awkward, and so, but I want to focus more to the positive thing. And the, here, the window on the back of, of that picture, there we had our the classrooms for practical work or for crafts. So first grade to sixth grade in East Germany, we had uh, crafting 
um, I don't know exactly how to translate it. So we had little projects and that was my one of my favorite subjects and that is what I treasure really about our education besides the political stuff uh, we had to go through. Uh, we were really educated to go to to work on projects with cardboard and plastic, woodwork, a little bit electrical, construction, metals. And so we were systematically educated with tools and uh, uh, mechanical uh, things, a workshop. Um, here's a picture, these are just internet pictures. I don't have pictures for myself and, and from this class. So this uh, from the on the top uh, right, uh, left, um, there you see all the kids. It looks like, well, this is kid, kids' work, children work, uh, they abuse children. I've heard sometimes those comments that uh, they, they said in East Germany they abuse the, the children uh, doing children work. This is absolutely not true. Um, what I have experienced, they systematically uh, trained us uh, to do practical work, working with tools, uh, and really it started with uh, we had always one project after another project, and we went over all the different types of tools and how we using what type of wood, what type of screws, what what everything it was a very systematic approach. Uh, we we, every project has a certain phase, a phase of planning with technical drawings and what type of pencils and they went really into the details. So it was really a systematic training how to uh, work. And this is correspond what uh, like trade schools are doing, but we started pretty early and we had a lot of fun. I mean, we we built toolboxes, we built um, boards with hooks for the keys uh, and all kinds of uh, things, a letter opener and um, from wood, from plastic, from uh, steel. And then when it came to uh, seventh grade, we, went, we had contracts with companies and uh, we, our school had a contract with a Function company, and we had then more metal work and work with press drills and all kinds of things. We had we were given special clothes. We uh, we had to dress up like these guys here on the top, and we had fantastic teachers. They um, here in this picture, they're more female teachers, but we usually had more, more male teachers. Uh, to the actual topic of um, gender studies uh, here, but it does, doesn't matter. I treasured uh, these teachers that were really good uh, in explaining all the in and outs, and uh, we had to, they, attend, they had a lot of attention for um, be, uh, that we have uh, comply with uh, safety, and here we have to do some. Uh, the delays um, that we have our hair not uh, getting into the uh, machines and things. So we produced items. I don't know what they did with our items, but it was a great opportunity to um, learn things. So And we did all kinds of stuff from um, just making special hooks for, for cabinets in the kitchen to uh, repairing faucets. And one I, I really liked was uh, concrete tiles. Um, and so we were always created for quality and quantity. So we had to produce certain, and also we assembled camping tables. They were exported to France. But again, I never felt exploited. I felt always being educated. And it was, that was the, uh, we had that every two weeks, we had the practical work on the other, week we had a theoretical work. So this was one subject. We also had, of course, uh, all these other subjects. But I want to point out that particular subject, which was very uh, shaped us a lot. Uh, we all we all 
uh, look forward that class especially the practical work and a lot of students who were not really that good in math and uh, language and languages and all these other but they got an A in these subjects. So we really liked these. Uh, the most most of us we liked it. We were we were all very proud of our products. So that was an important part of my education with all the other subjects. So other subjects were not that great, like well, of course the political stuff and things. But this again, this was very useful, and I I really benefit from that setting up my lab and all these things to do the technical and shaping up Neumann Hall. That helps me a lot to communicate with uh, technicians, mechanics, and um, so that that's my, my background. I uh, feel really strengthened from that time. So that was seventh to 10th grade. We worked there in, in this more industrial environment and by very professional teachers. Oh yeah, I got to move on. So, well, we had also field trips with our class at one field trip. I remember fifth grade, I was 10 or 11. We went to Berlin to the Brandenburg Gate and it looked pretty much that. I was, uh, so still maybe about 200 yards from the Brandenburg Gate. Uh, it was all the all the square there was um, actually this is a street it's kind of a, like a big boulevard or the avenue uh, Straße unter den Linden um, so it used to be traffic in in before the war and before um, uh, uh, the wall was built so the wall you see here is a little bit wide behind the Brandenburg tour with, Brandenburg Gate, uh, there's a little bit white there. That's the wall. It's built on the on the other side uh, there. So from the east side, you could not approach a whole lot. And then you had their uh, soldiers there guarding the gate with uh, guns there. And well, everybody wanted to look through and look through the what's there. Everybody was curious what's there. In the, in the, on the west, what's going on in the west side? So it's a nature building. If something is closed up, you have naturally a, feel, uh, a drive to look what's on the other side. So it was a little creepy at that time and sad uh, to see there something you cannot go and it's so close you can't go. And that was the feeling. That the feeling was we were sort of imprisoned in our own country. And um, that 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 strange feeling was kind of part of our life that we were limited in where we we can go. So, anyways, uh, life uh, went on, and uh, my father, my parents did, did decided to move to uh, Dessau. It's a city. South uh, west from Berlin. Let's see if the slide's working here. Yeah, here it's we moved over here. Uh, Dessau is famous for uh, the Bauhaus architecture, and they also had a big airplane uh, uh, industry, especially their soft of of course, uh, under Hitler. But, anyways, there was uh, it's uh, culturally, there was a lot of things going on there. There are a lot of castles around and parks, and it's very green there. And when we moved there, I um, so we, at that point, my actually my grandparents, they lived used to live in Magdeburg. It's just on the, in the middle of the way. Um, they moved, they determined to move to uh, Black Forest in the southwest Germany to other um, ends of my father. And so that was allowed for people who, uh, for retired people and people above age 60, 65, for women 60 and men 65, you could go to West Germany and could live there or move there. So they moved there and what my grandfather left 
to us was his cello. I ne never saw him playing the cello, but uh, he gave it to us. It was at the age 11 when we moved there to Dessau and I was interested in that instrument. My uncle, who is a, uh, a violist, he checked that instrument and said that's a pretty good instrument. So and I started going to music school there and I really loved the music school. And so music school is independent from a regular high school. It's just a different institution where you go in the afternoon and they have their own teachers and that you only do instruments, uh, music theory and orchestra and things. And I played there many or uh, concert with orchestra and had a lot of friends and fun with, within a music school. It, it was a really great time. And so I got pretty much involved in the music, but at the same time, um, I also uh, went on with my classes and uh, school and the teachers always kept track of what we are going to uh, be and what we want to, what trade school or what we want to study or what what our future uh, professional life is going to be. They took care of that. And so I was thinking, um, well, they suggested I should study music, but I was not, I wasn't sure about that because I thought, well, it's kind of uh, the life with all the concert evenings. It's maybe not a solid job. And I wanted to do something more solid. And since my brother was at that point, he went to trade school in that uh, fermentation plant in Dessau. They produced alcohol on a big scale for, I mean, for clinical purpose and um, whatever, pro not, not for consumption, so more as a chemical reagent. And so they also produced then a yeast for animals to um, to feed and uh, they also had uh, some other uh, inorganic uh, sections so that's shown here interestingly my cello teacher I think she used to live here in these other gray buildings on the, on the bottom right part of the picture you see all these gray houses so that was typical color we had there in East Germany and sometimes I went her to her home for cello lessons for some reason when our building music school building was renovated we had something somewhere else uh, music uh, lessons with the teacher so she used to live there I just remember that so but my brother he always uh, came home with all the stories we experienced while he's working there and so I was I influenced because we had a lot of chemical industries around and I, I felt like that's what probably supposed I should do. Also, I like chemistry and it was fascinating to know what the world is composed of and what you, all these um, the substances and you can do conversions and it's chemical reactions are always interesting to observe and to perform and so there was kind of inspiration pretty much and my the other actually where the trade school was um, was in a, uh, another um, plant it's called uh, well I need to uh, trans translate it's a German hyd hydration plant Rotleben Rotleben is close town close to Dessau so in I also worked there when I was later than a student. We also had some uh, internship there to work there three weeks. And I worked there in, a, in that plant for the margarines where they made the hyd uh, from where, where the hydrogenated oil, uh, vegetable oils to make margarines. And I saw how the margarine was produced. And uh, after that, well, it, I, I saw I saw the insides and kind of pretty rough there. So it's, it's, this plant was also uh, this um, industry in Rotleben 
was producing also pharmaceuticals and drugs and had also research and development section. My brother also was there involved with that while he was trained. Uh, so uh, anyways, that was pretty much inf influencing me as also the uh, other industries. So this is another plant, uh, the film uh, factory, uh, Orvo, Original Wolfen. And at the time when I went to, to uh, go to university, I had to go by train. I repassed always this uh, industrial area and it was awful with the air pollution. And so anyways, this, uh, this plant produced all these uh, uh, magnetic tapes and all the films. So, you know, aqua film and uh, these colored films. Actually, after the Second World War, the, when this plant was occupied, also by Americans, and they uh, took all the pa uh, patents or all the recipes and used that for the development of for color films. So actually, it was developed here first, the, the color films. So my father was very in into this kind of thing, and again, it was an impact. So here are some pictures from how it uh, looks, uh, how it looks right now or a couple of years ago when I visited Germany. Now this area, Wolfenbitterfeld, these are small towns close to Dessau. Um, they created a solar valley and a chemistry park. And uh, they used pretty much now uh, the now how and the, um, the, the, because all the people or a lot, a lot of people we are employees in chemical industry, and there are a lot of people had a, went to trade school, chemical production, or being a lab tech. So there was kind of going on there in the region, and uh, is that what what it is today? Okay, this is from my previous talk a little bit recycled. It was original for sixth graders made. So, anyways. You see the horizon. You, uh, every, every, everything was chemical industry there, around about in the region of Dessau, and um, that had a pretty much an impact to me. But still, I was there involved in the music school. So, anyways, uh, then was time to move on, and I did determined to study chemistry in Merseburg, and Merseburg is also surrounded by chemical industries. And um, here's the college, Leuna Merseburg. Leuna is uh, the name of a town close by where we have huge uh, chemical um, parks, uh, plants and industry um, parks, industry parks. Here you see pictures from our uh, college, technical college, where I stud started in 1988, the study of chemistry and also the, did my PhD studies there. And um, so at that time, uh, I, you know, it was all East, it was 88, was just one year before the wall came down, but everything was kind of planned and uh, related and uh, it was all, um, we had contracts with industries, industries to, um, where we, our future em employers. So I signed up for concrete industry in Bitterfeld, which is the, the other industrial zone. So I just thought, well, it may be good. Uh, so typical for East German uh, young folks, uh, for us, I think on average, we didn't mind to do one or the other job or where we go, we, we were just happy to, uh, because everything was, we all had food, we had uh, um, a, a place to live. I mean, in my case it was special because I, mean, I always lived in a church home or in a, in, a, in a house owned by the church, but everybody has a home. We had a free medical care, free education, or we paid a little piece, but it was, uh, bucks a year or something 
nothing compared to the US system. So everything was for free and we didn't have to worry anything. So the future employer was already planned ahead and everything was kind of regulated. We didn't have to think nothing about our existing and being or struggling to survive. There was, that was not at all in our minds. We had actually, the way it was, everything was planned and uh, you don't need to think about your life really. It, it was, it was pretty peaceful actually. Or we had, didn't have stress to lose a job or stress to become homeless or not to making it. Every, everybody made it somehow. But the other, the shadow side of that happy paradise life was that people became pretty lazy. So there was no responsibility. So everybody got a job, everybody goes to work, but they didn't do anything, they didn't care, there was no responsibility. So people lost their sense of self-responsibility and because everything was so easy. So that was a quite a bit a problem then when the change came, but I come come in a little bit. So at Melzer Book there, uh, there I met my husband. He worked in organic uh, laboratory. I was more inorganic. Here are some samples of my compounds, research compounds. I was very hooked up with the element rhodium and um, I don't want to bother you too much with chemistry, only a little bit, but not too much. So yeah, this was close by the Loina plants, close to our campus. Uh, that's why they built the college to educate a chemist who will work later there in this industry. But you can see uh, they're pretty much uh, uh, exhaust there from the slopes. And we had a lot of air pollution there. That was really terrible. And from that time, I, I caught um, chronic bronchitis in addition with some very cold windows we had, but we had some really bad air, air uh, pollution problems. And one day it was really creepy. There was some fog, kind of pinkish, pinkish orange fog or so. I don't know where, where, whether the street lamps made it that way or it was really that color but it was so bad you couldn't see your feet and you couldn't cross the road. And in our dormitories that stuff came in the hallway and it was like a creepy uh, horror movie or so. It was really creepy. So I remember that. And air pollution was a pretty, the same plant and you see the typical uh, car we had. Uh, so not everybody had the car, but who had the car, 80% of those who had the car, they had this trabant. Uh, it's made out of kind of cardboard or it's kind of fiber stuff, not really a metal uh, um, shaped, um, make it, I mean, it's just a frame was metal, uh, it was pretty light and had only two, uh, two cylinders, two cylinder engine, but everybody drove that. I also had one when I was student, maybe, well, just to go from A to B, it was enough. Um, the same hands at, at, uh, by night. And you may remember, well, it looks like Bishop or Corpus, the refineries. And in fact, if, when I, every time I pass Bishop, uh, the plants there, um, selling, so now it's BASF, which is all the German comp company, the, the headquarters is in German Ludwigshafen. Uh, so it's kind of your um, your Kingsville uh, Corpus Corpus, kind of like home feeling seeing that uh, scene, uh, have that scenic background. So the other close by plant, uh, they produce rubber. They, it was purchased uh, or which was bought out by Dow Chemicals. And it, they also had a lot of problems with air pollution, all the carbide dust uh, on the roofs. You don't see it right now here, but everybody had their asthma and bronchitis and it was really bad. So 
I skip the chemistry slide. It's just the product they produced there. Um, so anyways, now it came, uh, now we are approaching the critical year, 89, where uh, in the spring 80, 89, we felt already that government was sort of not no longer in a shape, not doing anything. The, all the pollution problems and economic problems uh, became bigger and bigger. Streets were not repaired and uh, it, it's just falling apart. Everything is kind of became very awkward. And then, then in the summer, we, have, we are actually had spent uh, that summer in with family in, um, in Hungary and we heard a lot of people escaping. But still, so, and then the fall in September, October, demonstration started. And then, and uh, I have to make sure I get everything done here. And uh, at the November 9th, uh, the wall uh, was open there in Berlin and everybody went there. And I remember lecture halls were empty. I didn't want to go because I, I have kind of, I went in one demonstration in Dessau and I was squeezed in all the mass of people and I had of, I couldn't stand the mass. I mean, I liked the, the absolutely it was exciting to hear people speaking open up, but I prefer to watch that of television rather to be in, in, in this mass of people because I, I was kind of, it's kind of scary being physically there meshed uh, with, with the people, but it was, Definitely a next very exciting time when uh, we people start speaking up and eventually the door was open. This was kind of unbelievable within such a short time, and actually it was just made by accident. Uh, well, I don't want to go over the details, but it was just very exciting having that border open, and because of the pressure of the people, and so. Then we had an, um, the transition time, which was a very confusing time uh, or exciting, and then it became confusing. Uh, and then let's see, move on here. October the 3rd in 1990, we had then the, uh, it was just uh, 30 years ago, um, the border were gone. So the borders were open and we had unified uh, Germany. And then we start, uh, uh, we had a completely new life. So East Germany, we, we what, what happened essentially that everything what has been set up in West Germany was now applied for East Germany. So all our East German products were wiped out the stores and we were placed the West German products. So we got the new currency that we got Deutschmark and so we, we, it felt more like a colonialism of, we were colonialized from West Germany and we had no time to set up our own uh, stuff in East Germany. It was a little quick and a lot of new stuff came over us in East Germany and we had no clue about uh, things and there was a lot of uh, so-called unification crime and that Time was very uncertain, and then we, I was then in my second year of study, and then um, everything, my contract disappeared with uh, some uh, concrete uh, uh, factory in Bitterfeld that all disappeared, and uh, we had to uh, uh, get, had new orientation, and that was the point where people what I mentioned, hit people so hard because they have never learned to take care of their own lives. Everything was regulated. There was no uh, responsibility for their own lives because everything was there, everything was given. And now at that time uh, in the early 90s, we had, a, uh, uh, we had a lot of social problems, extreme uh, un uh, increase of unemployment, 30% unemployment in Dessau, and uh, people stole, yeah, they releases people in masses, 10,000 
so people they closed plants everybody was all of a sudden in the street and that was a horrible time people start drinking and uh start to doing all this you couldn't go out in the night because it was no longer safe people came with knives and killing people and hurting people and it was horrible uh the social um it was very explosive there explosive atmosphere among the people and so i i was there in my early 20s and i did from well okay forget about that was wanted to uh finish with my uh, uh master of of chemistry so we when we study we don't have the bachelor this system we finished with a master everything we had kind of a diploma and call it a diploma equivalent to master so forget about the master i uh, and this uh, um, uh, contract i have to think something new and there was a um, professor he had some openings for phd positions uh, research positions research um, positions available and i signed up for that and then while i just i thought well i just go ahead and qualify myself to do my phd i'm not sure at all i was completely average i was not the best i was just average c student uh, but the standards were also pretty high on the other side it was fairly impossible it was not almost impossible to get an a there for chemistry it was you had to be really super genius so I was uh, signing up for that just to to go on to move on. That was actually the critical time to uh, what everything changed in life. So I had to completely reorganize my life. That everybody else had to do that at that time. Some people found it easy. Some other people did not find anything, and some still struggle. Uh, from that time, I never could could find a could find a ground. Anyways, I moved on. Uh, I did my PhD there in '97, uh, and then I moved on to let's see here. Not walking to Würzburg, uh, my next uh, stage of life uh, for a one-year postdoc, and that was due to a, a collaboration of my PhD supervisor with another colleague in uh, Würzburg and uh, from there I applied for a fellowship in from uh, our German Academy of Science and I moved on I probably have to stop in at, at four o'clock I don't want to give some I don't know what time limit is but I move on a little faster so I had one postdoc here in Würzburg pretty city uh, really nice with all the wine yards and the castle there uh, and then um, here, just a quick view of the BSF as Locadia Ludwigshafen or the chemical industry zone, but it's kind of. So I went, moved on to uh, Naples, Italy. There was also a collaboration between our school popping up and new uh, European, uh, European um, academic co corporations. And that was my golden time in uh, Naples, um, three years postdoc with a, a German fellow, a research fellowship from the uh, German Academy Leopoldina and um, <clears throat> that's equivalent to the British, uh, the Royal, so Royal Society. So I was very happy with that and build up um, my experience for independent research at the University of Naples. <clears throat> just very old and traditional I, I move on a little faster here so Naples is a particular also a school of life very chaotic coming there as a German very organized living in a very organized country and coming uh, to South Italy totally chaotic and had to find my way that's my research lab uh, it looked very chaotic and outdated but I made some very uh, important experience with my research and moved on to other elements and made new friends and with some I am still in touch. Um, I also met another German friend. 
she was uh, there on the, the, the one here on the back. Um, and uh, she has uh, studied there sociology, the same uh, academic exchange pro program there. And we're still friends. And um, also last year I had a colleague coming here for a lecture, give some lectures uh, from, from the school. And here we are, was involved with the installation of an uh, animal instrument uh, and got a lot of experience there. And then the uh, department moved to a new campus, but this all more in detail. So back to Germany, and I'm almost done here. Uh, back, uh, so I did not know what to do next. So next, I look for another position, academic position. I said, well, now I'm familiar with university and research setup. And I was there, uh, got a research position at the University of Erlangen Nuremberg with Professor John Gladys, and he is an American professor. He is now at uh, Texas A&M College Station. He moved actually two years after me to Texas, so I came back across before him, and so it's kind of interesting. So he, I was in an in industrial project, and here this is what you see in the film hall. That is what the project was I had to construct, and that was interesting. I rocked that. I designed that the equipment of uh, polymerization device and I worked with the mechanics and it was really great fun to do that. And again, coming back to the first slides I showed you, all my experience from the time back helped me here. So you see all the theme of my life is all the experience I had, I applied what I learned and applied it to the next stage. I've never really planned ahead. And then I applied for position in the United States. And then in 2005, I ended up in West Texas and at UTBB. Um, in the meantime, they have a different logo there in Odessa, UTBB, West Texas. So the complete opposite of Naples, uh, wide open land, uh, almost nothing there, huge campus, just one little, uh, well, huge building, but there's nothing there really. It's, it's but I had a lab, research lab, uh, set up a research group, all these nice kids. I, I here Vivian Gomez, he is a, a great son of a former uh, math faculty here, um, I found out uh, sometimes. So anyways, they're nice kids. I, I would like to work with them. And then in 2012, I started over in Kingsville because at UTBB there were budget cuts, they couldn't keep me there. So I started here 2012 as assistant professor and got promoted then in 2016 as associate. And then there was a need for department chair and that was the least I, I planned in my life to, uh, now I'm ended up being department chair and hope I'm, I'm doing it right and I can improve the chemistry department and that's pretty much the story of my life. And I made it just at four o'clock here. Okay, thank you all for your attention and um, for being here and listen. So I'm open for question if it's still time. Thank you so much, Dr. Hahn. That was absolutely fascinating and a good, and I've actually been to Mecklenburg, believe it or not, uh, but, uh, thank you so very much for sharing your story with us and your experiences. It was very educational and inspiring. And if anybody has any questions, feel f I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself or not, but you can also place them in the chat box. And we have several applauses and thank yous already. So if you have any questions, uh, please let us know. Nobody. No. Like always can, well, I always can, uh, I always can, uh, if someone has a question, I mean, you have to digest all this stuff. Uh, Ooh, Dr. Melanie oh. says, I'd like to hear more about your experiences in the pioneers. <laughs> okay, that, that, that's just an interesting thing. So the thing was, 
uh, since I was a, a, a child of a, of a pastor family, um, typically the uh, a lot, I mean, every, all the uh, pastors or preachers, they did not uh, wanted to have their kids being a part of this youth organization. So all siblings, my, including myself, we did not attend, uh, we, we did not uh, participate. So I was always an outsider and watched it from outside. And that gave me an experience being an outsider. And from the social standpoint, I was an outsider. I would have loved to attend one or the other activities because they were just activities. But it was all soaked with the ideology, of course. And my parents said, no, you don't go there, you don't attend, this is bad. So my parents always said, no, you don't do that, it's bad. And as a child, do you want to socialize with other kids and say, well, I also want to experience, want to be a part of a group. So that was kind of a little bit difficult time for us, or I, I learned in that time so things I, I learned what the life is being an outsider seeing the system with very critical eyes as my parents taught me and actually I my, I, I always gave my uh, I believed in my parents I, I don't think they did wrong to us they wanted to protect us being brainwashed uh, being brainwashed by this ideology that protected us, not sucked in in that. So they are told us what the reality was. And I had one experience. We had to, in history class, we had to talk about the um, a movement in the 50s when the Russians uh, uh, kind of came with tanks and just uh, cut down the demonstrations everywhere and my parents were students at the time so they told us what they experienced but in school we had to say something different and there was always this discrepancy between the 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 lies uh they put us like the, why we had to the rationale why we had to uh uh build the wall because we had to protect us against the american aggressors the, all the Americans are completely bad people. You know, they're all aggressive and, and, and want to do, want to just take over. But the reality was the, the country was leeching out academics, uh, 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 engineers, only the intellectual, they escaped because they couldn't stand. The, the cis artists, everybody who wants to develop their free um, life, and thoughts they escaped and they want to block that they want to keep they want to protect protect the country or wanted to have uh keep the people inside not leeching out that they have still some people in the country to do the intellectual i mean the intellectual artists so it was it was completely so there was actual different things going on so that time all this this what happened gave me a, a more critical view of what's when things are planned and set up i kind of see uh, easy if it's true or not true what's going wrong you know to um question i think the critical i learned their critical thinking pretty pretty much so that that's what I learned. But the other effect was to be uh, an outsider, and but that helped me also to identify my next who is an outsider, to have an eye on outsiders, to integrate outsiders, I would say. That's another effect, what, what I learned from. Yes, thank you so very much. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Han? If not, thank you again so very much for sharing your experiences. 
and I hope that everybody in the audience John, have a wonderful, uh, I guess we're almost evening now, on our afternoon and evening. So thank you so very much and uh, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you, Baba. You thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for attending. Thank you.